Good morning, everyone. Um, I am coming to you from Washington, D.C. today. Um, welcome to today's Thursday talk. Our Thursday talks aim to bring you the best and most innovative learning there is in the peace building field and beyond. Whether this is your first Thursday talk or you're one of our regular participants, it is great to have you with us today. My name is Jennifer Howell, and I am the Communications and Learning Officer at Search for Common Ground and the Communications Lead for DME for Peace, and I'll be moderating today's session. So today, our discussion is focusing on escaping perpetual beginnings, challenges and opportunities for local atrocity prevention in the DRC, based off the new report recently published by today's host. Today, our discussion will be led by Dimitri Kotsiras, Research Analyst, Aji Sise, Policy and Research Assistant, and Megan Renoir, Research Manager at PeaceDirect, and they're all part of PeaceDirect's programs and research team. Thank you so much for joining us today. And just a note about how we will spend our time together. As our hosts are presenting, you can write your questions using the question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and we will address it once we reach the Q&A portion. When you do that, also please try to write your name and affiliation if you are able. That way I can attribute the question back to you. So with that, let me hand it over to Megan to take it away. Thanks so much, Jen. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. Um, as Jen said, my name is Megan Renoir, and I'm the research manager at Peace Direct. Um, so this project, uh, this is a, a piece of research that's come, to, come out of a larger project, uh, which was conducted jointly by Peace Direct and Research Initiatives for Social Development. For those of you who aren't familiar with these organizations, Peace Direct uh, is an organi uh, international organization uh, that works on peace building in partnership with local peace builders worldwide, and we support pre-existing peace building activities. Um, we do this by providing direct funding to local organizations for their work and also by conducting research and advocacy around issues of locally led peace building. Um, and our partner organization for this research was Research uh, Initiatives for Social Development. So they are a local research institute based in Bukavu, Democratic Republic of Congo. And their aim is to contribute to peace building and socioeconomic development via research, training, and evaluations. Um, if anyone is doing research or evaluations in DRC, I highly recommend you look them up. They are incredible partners to work with. Um, so just to start, um, I'll give a quick overview of what this presentation will cover. Um, we're gonna be discussing the research project itself. So the kind of aims of the project, the methodology, and a few selected findings that we thought would be interesting or useful for this audience. Secondly, we will be discussing a couple of challenges and lessons learned um, about the research process itself and our, our kind of partnership with RSD. And then finally, we'll end with a couple of questions for consideration that will hopefully provoke a bit of, of conversation at the end. And overall, the aim of this presentation for us is to really explore how our partnership with the Local Research Institute um, led to some significant learnings and improvements in our own research practice as an organization. So this research was conducted um, as a kind of offshoot of another project that Peace Direct is working on called Strengthening Networks to Prevent and Respond to Violence. Um, so the overall project is focusing on supporting locally led atrocity prevention in the Great Lakes region, primarily in Burundi and the DRC. And we're focusing on trying to understand how we can support stronger networking between atrocity prevention actors, how we can make atrocity prevention mechanisms more robust or, or facilitate stronger mechanisms across um, civil society and across borders, and also develop a stronger evidence base um, around the kind of overall uh, environment of atrocity prevention in Eastern Congo. So this project has a couple of activities within it. Um, one is early warning and early response capacity building with partners. So working together to identify and develop indicators for EWAR networks. Um, also mapping of local atrocity and, uh, prevention actors in Ituri. We've already done mapping of actors in both North and South Kivu. So this is an extension on that work. And then finally, we conducted research um, to collect data about local atrocity prevention and its most effective practices. And that's where this research has come out of. And just some context for that, um, this research was kind of born of a last minute funding opportunity that came out of the project. 
Um, so it was done on a very, very short timeline. We had three months from the initial planning stages um, all the way down to collecting data and, and conducting analysis. So keep that in mind as we walk through some of the lessons here. The aims of this research specifically um, were to really try and build a picture of what is going on in terms of atrocity, local atrocity prevention in Eastern Congo. So we wanted to understand the status and composition of atrocity prevention efforts, including who is working on atrocity prevention, what work are they doing, how are they working together, et cetera, and also what approaches to atrocity prevention are considered effective by local actors and international actors, and then what are some of the primary challenges facing this work and the people conducting this work. And then finally, um, as funders, we really want to understand how regional and international actors can provide um, really, really strong support to local activities that are already happening and where our support is going to be most beneficial. So the research was conducted, as I said, over a three month period. We started with a literature review um, and this was all conducted jointly with RSD. Um, so we started to try and understand the different arguments that have been made about atrocity prevention in this region and understand um, what work has already been done to try and map out uh, these initiatives. This was followed by 169 um, individuals being interviewed. So nine of these were via focus group discussions and 72 were uh, individual interviews. And then we had a manual qualitative analysis conducted by RISD first to bring the perspective of um, the contextual perspective from Congolese and uh, followed by a coding of the transcripts in NVivo and an analysis based on that. And if you look at the, the chart to the right, um, this shows the breakdown of the different actors that we interviewed for the research. So it was primarily looking at local civil society actors, um, community members and community leadership but we also relied heavily on a range of um, broader actors that are relevant to the work. So international actors conducting work, um, state actors, including security actors, and then local academics as well. And I will hand over now to Dimitri to take us into the key findings. Sure, I'm just gonna briefly discuss uh, three key findings that have come out of the research that are both uh, overlapping and uh, at times somewhat surprising. So the first of one, uh, first of it is um, that atrocity violence in the Eastern DRC uh, is deeply tied to underlying issues of chronic state fragility and can't be separated from that. And that um, that atrocities in themselves are actually part of an environment where there's a like a larger and broader uh, complex set of forms of violence that um, are at interplay with one another and are interlinked that both underpin and perpetuate atrocities and can lead to further cycles of violence. In a, in a cyclical fashion. So the first uh, and, and primary um, source of, uh, of conflict that was cited by uh, most of the interviewees was the issue of land tenure insecurity. And this is uh, tied to uh, overlapping, inconsistent, and often competing institutional frameworks for land management. And this is partly because of um, the historical connections and linkages between land, power, and identity. And, uh, and that emerged as the primary cause of atrocities and violence. Um, and the region, sorry. Uh, and then other uh, significant causes uh, included political and customary power struggles. So this is tied to issues of succession, um, to uh, the instrumentalization of identity by politicians and uh, political elites to uh, get uh, political and economic gains. And, uh, and this essentially um, linkages also with business networks and uh, rebel groups to basically use them as, as tools in, in their political contestations. And then uh, a sort of dual side of things, there's the low state capacity, which is tied to the sort of uh, lack of capacity among institutions, whether it's judicial institutions or um, you know just general state institutions and state presence in remote and uh, border regions. Um, that's also, as, as pointed in parentheses, the inability to uh, train and pay salaries for security forces, where there are weak command and control structures. And then the state complicity and violence is tied into that because there are mutinies, uh, rebellions, and there's just uh, a lack of state presence to mitigate against uh, violence committed by other uh, conflict entrepreneurs. And uh, the key takeaway here that's, uh, that's listed is that structural challenges such as land tenure and security have actually received little attention from domestic and international peace building actors. A lot of the framing externally for about the violence in Eastern DRC tends to view things along uh, an ethnic or identity-based component. 
and not only uh, paints part of the picture and actually misses the deeper interlinkages um, to other structural issues. And therefore, atrocity prevention efforts can only be effective if they uh, actually address those other underlying uh, structural causes of violence. Next slide, please. The second key finding is that, um, apologies, uh, you have to go to the previous slide. Yes, uh, the second key finding is that uh, local conceptual understandings of identity-based violence and atrocity prevention actually differ greatly from external definitions. And that taps into what I was saying earlier, where global policy frameworks tend to set very uh, uh, finite and definitive kind of parameters uh, about what an atrocity crime consists of. And that's seen quite differently by local actors who are uh, less concerned with things like the mass scale of the violence and look more at the regular occurrence of the violence. Likewise, there, the overemphasis of identity um, as a, a key underlying uh, driver of violence uh, actually has created unhelpful and reductive um, framing of analysis that ignores those, that interplay that I mentioned. And therefore, to understand the causal factors of issues such as identity-based violence, um, that will help to improve on better targeting and better atrocity prevention overall. And atrocity prevention activities um, in the global policy framework are often seen as a specific set of activities like early warning and early response, but to the local respondents, um, they saw them as largely indistinguishable from other activities that would traditionally fall under the kind of fields of conflict prevention and peace building. And in their view, they're one and the same. And so these distinctions are externally imposed, seen as arbitrary and ill-fitting, and oftentimes lead to funding modalities that further, that further silo prevention work and prevent um, better coordination and cross-communication. And therefore, funding and policy structures that create these false economies um, between the different prevention agendas uh, are undermining atrocity prevention actions in the region. So uh, the, that leads to deficiencies in the way that coordination and collaboration is undertaken between different atrocity prevention actors. Um, uh, they're duplicative, oftentimes ineffective. There are, um, um, there's a lack of horizontal linkages and especially the vertical linkages with this reciprocal information flows uh, that are just absent. And the key uh, three factors here that I, I want to highlight specifically are that there's an absence of formalized structures at the regional and national level or even regional, regional level uh, across the Great Lakes region for coordinating and standardizing atrocity prevention activities. And the lack of functioning national or subnational atrocity prevention mechanisms prevents uh, local atrocity prevention activities from feeding upward and um, you know, supporting broader atrocity prevention mechanisms across the region. And then part of that is the, the issue of ongoing mistrust between various sets and groups of actors, uh, primarily um, between uh, local civil society and the government and state security actors who, as I mentioned, have been uh, known to be complicit in the violence, uh, but also between the, the civil society actors themselves because of competition um, and between uh, communities and state actors um, for the, the lack of state capacity to support their needs, and then uh, communities and CSOs as well, but as well as INGOs and the binary between sort of donor communities and, and civil society actors that uh, don't always see eye to eye, especially on uh, funding modalities. And that taps into the third bit, which is around inadequate funding because of the over projectization of activities, where a lot of the activities are focused on short term funding, uh, these externally imposed silos, and the lack of direct and sustainable long term funding for civil society actors. And therefore, a lot of these activities um, fail to um, see sustainable outcomes. For example, with early warning and early response activities, um, they've really managed to. Uh, basically establish a good set of early warning uh, capacities and systems in place, but they, because of the lack of direct funding and sustainable funding, it's led to a failure to convert that into effective early prevention, early response work to, um, to respond to the atrocities that are being uh, monitored. And so the key takeaway points here are that formal coordination mechanisms that are more accessible and that, that uh, basically involve uh, atrocity prevention actors at all levels are key to be able to address issues of trust and inefficiencies to make sure that there are reciprocal flows of information so that there, that can help to build trust and also to feed 
not just uh, bottom up, but top down as well. And then uh, there needs to be a prioritization of more direct and long-term resourcing to strengthen the, the local civil society actors' ability to address the root causes of atrocity violence. And I'll pass this on now to Aji to discuss a couple of uh, key challenges and lessons learned. Thanks, Dimitri. I'll start by talking about how assumptions early on about key terms and their definitions led to significant challenges within the project. As, as mentioned by Megan earlier, because this piece of research accompanied a wider program and we had to use an underspend in three months, we did not have the required time to establish agreement with consortium members on key terms and frame of analysis. As a result, this led to a lack of consensus regarding the definitions of key terms, notably on concepts such as atrocity prevention and identity-based violence. And this led to conflicting interpretations of local dynamics in Eastern DRC after data collection. Um, I think being strategic with partners, not only about their work, but in their approaches to certain concepts is very important. For example, um, we were focused on having local, dynam local dynamics inform the research while a partner was approaching an, um, definitions from an international policy level. And these are just one of the silos that have been reflected in the research. Although um, international definitions might not necessarily translate at the local level, even if the work has the same goal. And therefore, there's a need for flexibility in dealing with such differences to ensure that quality of work is still delivered. Thus, um, a key learning that emerged from this issue is that gaining consensus of, on definitions prior to research design, based on conversation with research partners and local stakeholders, would have helped us avoid concept conceptual challenges later on in the project. And one main learning that we have established is that had we engaged um, RISIT prior to initial research design, we would have approached the project in a much more informed manner and avoided potential analytical conflicts in the long run. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, ensuring the research was as inclusive and as participatory as possible was fundamental to the project's success. As we made sure that definitions of key terms were first and foremost reflective of local perceptions and realities, helped us provide more of a practical understanding of issues and find effective and realistic ways of mitigating such issues. And following up with interviewees and ensuring their engagement throughout the research helped us refine findings and ensure that they reflect local realities. This also supported um, uptake and dissemination after publication. And we have been told that our report is being used by CSOs for advocacy purposes. And this was one of our goals, find practical ways of supporting local actors in their work and amplify their voices. Um, being open to changing the research direction of theme according to the data um, proved to be very helpful, effective in this work, as this comes from understanding that no matter how much you learn about a topic, for us, we are still external actors and regardless, having an open mind and being flexible when it comes to this type of research can help identify unintended factors that are crucial to the research topic that might have been ignored for reasons beyond our control. For the next slide, um, a key point to have emerged from this research process is that forging long-term relationships with local researchers or research organizations enables the project to be effective and efficient despite significant challenges of which some are COVID related. The fact that we have worked with research, we have worked with RISD before, helped build trust between us and it allowed us to get the work off the ground quickly on the tight timeline as we knew that they were capable of carrying out such work. Um, RISD themselves brought conceptual, logistical and contextual expertise that enabled the full project cycle to be successful. For example, they used their connections to reach several integral stakeholders that we didn't have access to, and they were able to carry work in areas that we had no experience working in. Um, finally, um, being working with um, RISID and other partners in the DRC enable local collabor collaboration. Through the project, we see RISID 
forged strong relationships with our partner in Beni, one of them, Central Resolution Conflict, who they now work with to define research priorities for Peace Direct. Um, to add to that, the project has led to a strengthened relationship between us and local partners, and we, are, we have looked to work outside of funding in order to identify research work based on needs and opportunities, informed by contextual knowledge in order to make sure that future research is more effective in targeting issues. I'll now get back to Megan. Um, Dimitri, I think this is you for the first question, actually. Dimitri? Apologies for that, I was muted. Uh, so yeah, I was just, the first question is kind of uh, tapping into some of the challenges that we faced uh, around the conceptual understandings of certain term, terms that were used uh, in the research and to try to basically ground the research in a, a, a healthy foundation. The, the challenge that we faced was around balancing, you know, basically taking the findings from the, the literature review and essentially as it's put there, doing our homework and making sure that we are able to um, deliberate properly along uh, these contextual frameworks, but also making sure that we provide a bit of space for a more exploratory type of research where some of the definitions that we might have come up with may not align with uh, local practitioners and therefore to simply ask them um, you know, openly what they considered was an identity-based finance or trust prevention um, helped us to really um, salvage and kind of fix some of these conceptual challenges that we faced initially. So the question here that uh, I, I tried to put out was essentially how to strike that healthy balance between uh, having sort of predefined set framing of analysis um, versus allowing for a more flexible exploratory approach um, via the research process that can enable unexpected and significant findings. And then, uh, yeah, um, Megan, I believe you're doing a second. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, a second question that we had um, is around the, the fact that through working with RISD through this project and, and one before um, and learning about how the flexibility of our approach um, has led to us understanding really strong conceptual differences at the local level and how that can expand our, our approach to research. Um, it's led to a really fundamental shift in our own research practice. So as Aji mentioned, um, our research portfolio going forward is going to be informed first and foremost by our local partners and the topics that they would like to research first, and then we will partner with them to do that research. Um, so we're, we're trying to think about how else can we create these kind of equal partnerships with local researchers, researchers that further decolonize research practice in this way. Um, and a final question we have here. Um, we're hoping to learn from the audience in this talk um, about what other kind of lessons you have learned from research partnerships that shifted your own organization's research practice or thinking, um, particularly around decolonizing research methodologies. Um, so I'll leave it there and welcome any questions and comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Megan, Dimitri, and Aji. Uh, and um, now I... I'm going to move us on to the Q&A portion of our discussion. A couple of notes about our format for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Thursday talks. You can submit a question or comment in two ways. The first is through the question function. The second is to click on the hand icon to raise your hand, which will allow us to unmute your microphone so that you can ask your question live. And these are all on your GoToWebinar dashboard. When you submit your question for us, we ask that you submit your name and affiliation. And just to note, these talks are recorded and posted on DME for Peace so that those who are not able to join us today can go back and listen to the presentation and discussion. So thank you so much. Um, we did have a question come in during the presentation and it was just a bit more around um, from Jogan Baker, uh, a bit more around the definitions of atrocity. I think um, how I'm gonna frame it and I hope this is okay, Jorgen, um, sort of what you've seen at an international level, it being defined as what the local um, organizations defined it as and uh, 
now what do you see it after having those conversations and needing to adjust it or seeing that you needed to adjust it? How would you define atrocity? Um, yep, I can take that one. And Dimitri, Great. feel free to jump in if um, if you want to elaborate, because I know this is this is what you've done a lot of work on. Um, so our initial definition of atrocities was informed very much by global policy. So um, the standard um, things around genocide um, and these kind of large scale uh, events. And the research that we conducted before this, and then also through this research, um, we found that local actors view atrocities much more around the actual nature of the violence itself. So if it's particularly gruesome, um, and then also about, in, in a sense, the scale of the violence, um, but that scale is much more prolonged. So it's not an immediate event um, in the same way maybe global policy or the media has portrayed um, atrocities. So it's much more um, a long-term additive effect of uh, violence against a particular group or against a, a community not necessarily aligned by identity factors. Um, and it really is tied to the nature of the violence in that way. Um, Dimitri, am I missing anything on that? Is there any uh, nuance? I think you covered most of it. I think the, uh, the, the only last distinction is that from uh, global policy frameworks, atrocities are seen as, as quite deliberate in nature and that they're discriminate. They, and that's where the identity-based violence frame comes into this, where um, it's, it's seen as a way to understand how the, the violence is perpetuated and how it, uh, it leads to, to further cycles of violence. But for a lot of local practitioners, um, it's more the regularity that could be also discriminate, but could be seen as atrocities based on the sort of uh, barbaric nature of, of the crime itself and how um, the cycles of violence can just continue on for a prolonged period of time, as you've mentioned. So the, the deliberate element of it is, is contested, um, at least uh, for local practitioners from our research. Yeah, and, and I would say deliberate in the um, kind of normative sense of it. So one of the, I, I would say the main thing that really came through this research and that the interviewees really wanted people to understand is that, yes, identity-based violence is a thing. Um, yes, atrocities obviously happen. However, the way we've come to conceptualize them and address them through atrocity prevention is not necessarily helpful because it tends to um, skirt over structural and very political issues um, within the kind of conflict environment that are a bit too touchy really for, for policymakers often. So um, that was really brought to the surface through this. So it's a very nuanced understanding. Um, so yes, please let us know if, if it's not clear because this is a, a very sticky subject. Yes, uh, thank you. It kind of seems one of the overarching themes of the project um, is around definitions and, and jargon. And Colin Jacobs wrote in um, with the question uh, and stating, sounds like too much jargon and specific vocabulary, reduced ability to relate to local interviewees and read across and read across the problems. What helped reduce this mystification? Well, I think uh, one thing that we had explained in the presentation is that we started uh, shifting our frame of analysis. We had, uh, as one of the earliest earlier challenges, had these kind of preconceived ideas or notions of how we would frame our analysis based on the literature review of uh, global, global policy frameworks and other academic literature. And having uh, consultations with the local research partner, RISD, uh, allowed us to a bit recognize some of the, the limitations or failings of that approach and tackle it with a more exploratory um, process where we would ask, simply ask, without trying to shape or um, uh, shoot people into particular silos that tend to happen when you're talking about a trust prevention work and identity-based violence. And that's where we were able to get various different interpretations of you know what these terms are or, or what the the complex form complex forms of violence are, are actually like and how you characterize them and that allowed us to open a bit the, um, our, our frame of analysis and this you want to yeah yeah this, this lesson has also really contributed to the way we're adjusting our research process approach as an organization in terms of um working with local research partners and our peace building partners to identify research topics from their perspective first so that the uh, frame of analysis and the kind of definitions around jargon are relevant to that context first and foremost. So rather than being imposed from the outside, 
Um, and this is being put to practice already with a, a second iteration of this research with, again, with RISD and with our local partner, CRC. Um, and they've come up with the research topic um, together and they informed us about what was relevant and, and needed. And so all those key terms are informed yeah, by their, their contextual knowledge first. So it's um, trying to shift, I guess, the flow of, of learning away from this uh, standardized model of, of international policy terms and jargon, um, putting an ill-fitting kind of frame around, uh, yeah, complex dynamics. Um, this is just for my own understanding. Um, it was mentioned that establishing trust through that Peace Direct was able to establish trust through previous projects um, and how that was important to getting the project off the ground initially. And um, my question for clarification was, did you work with RISD specifically before or how was that connection made um, for this project? Yeah, so we, we've had a, a fairly long term, I mean, in terms of Peace Direct, we're, we're not that old as an organization, so we've had a fairly long term, relatively long term relationship with RISD. Um, in 2017, we first partnered with them for another project called Facilitating Financial Sustainability. Um, and they've been our primary research partner uh, since then. Um, but they are also very well established with a number of, of universities around the world. So um, a, very, a very strong reputation already. but. Yes, we've, we've worked with them and established really strong personal relationships. Um, and that's enabled us to essentially exercise a bit more creativity and flexibility in how we're thinking about research as an organization and how we're able to partner with them. Right. Yeah, adding um, on to that, some of the, the prior research that uh, we had conducted in the same region allowed us to, essentially, when we first started uh, conducting research around this issue, this thematic issue uh, in the Eastern uh, DRC, um, the intent was it was for it not to be a sort of one-off thing, but a continuous process, an iterative process to build upon previous research findings and kind of get a bit more of the a nuanced uh, level of analysis around the context, the conflict dynamics, and the other aspects of um, both peace building and trust prevention work, whatever you want to call it, because for them it's, it's all in the same, one in the same. And that's where we were able to build upon initial foundations when we did uh, earlier exploratory research that was a little more generalized and then uh, jumped into this with a, a bit more of a, a clear idea of what we'd like to talk, but also making sure that we don't um, undermine the, the misalignment that we, we recognized with the uh, conceptual understandings of certain terminology. Great. Um, segueing to, as you mentioned, um, sort of the underlying conditions, um, Nupes Kibiswa, and I apologize for any mispronunciation, um, just kind of wanted to know a bit more around what you found to be through your uh, project, the root causes um, of, of the atrocity. You, you touched on it a bit, um, but a bit more around root causes um, that maybe you haven't mentioned in addition to um, also a bit more about your process on decolonizing research practices and um, the complicities that sustain these atrocities. So just a bit more um, information about that if you're able to share. And I I also encourage uh, Nupes, and I again apologize for mispronunciation, if you have um, any more specific questions about this, um, please do feel free to send them in. I, I could talk, talk about a bit uh, some of the, I, I definitely could share as well. We have a certain sure. figures that outline, it's, on, it's in the report as well. Uh, a list of what was most cited by interviewees as, as primary great. causes of violence. Um, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. A, a couple of, of uh, key ones like land tenure and security and uh, customary and political power struggles, but as well as others that are can be kind of um, unpacked, which is uh, around the state capacity, the lack of state presence, and the state complicity in violence. And that also is tapped into the lack of rule of law, generally speaking, because the state lacks the capacity to enforce the rule of law and don't have the monopoly on the use of violence. Um, and there are other uh, slightly more minor um, but still relevant issues, including um, natural resource exploitation and the sort of uh, cross-border um, illicit trafficking of natural resources. But there's also the, the cross-border conflict dynamics that, that play into it where lots of these rebel groups operate to and from uh, the across the border, sorry, from DRC 
uh, based in either Uganda, Rwanda, or Burundi, depending on the various groups you're talking about. Um, but those are all seen as part of the, the, the bigger problem, which is the interlinkage between power, land, and identity at, at the sort of crux, at the source of a lot of the violence. And that's why uh, the land tenure and security issue is most cited by close to 90% of all interviewees. So that, that's for the first uh, question. Great. Um, actually, I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is my mistake, uh, Dimitri, is actually um, they want to ask the, uh, question, the question themselves. So let me first, before I send you off in a direction and you share so much that might not be exactly what they were asking for, right. um, I'm going to unmute. Uh, I'm going to unmute you now so you can ask the question yourself. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, please? Yes, yes. sounds great. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. My name's Nopes. Nopes, okay. Thank you so much for the <laughs> correction. I appreciate it. Yeah, I am professor in conflict resolution, uh, genocide prevention. And uh, I deal with the questions of uh, atrocity prevention and, and so on. But the first thing I want to say is this. When, uh, first about the decolonizing research, people who are struggling with those problems and atrocities in the Eastern DRC and in particular, they are people who do not speak either French or English. Mm -hmm but they have to respond to questions from people who speak French or English and who have the logic maybe from the West or local leaders who have their French logic. And sometimes I think for me, it's the best, the best way is first to, to try to introduce people, local people, in those topic, then they can be able to give things the way they they have them in their minds and the way they struggle with them uh, locally. That's one of the way I think it's it's necessary to train and educate people on those questions before the research uh, take place. That's one thing. The other thing is about the issues, uh, the land, uh, the um, root cause. I usually, I, uh, the the doxa now is land resources and so on. But none of researchers and scholars mention the question of ethno nationalism, which is one of the root cause of what is what is happening in the DRC. You can, you, we, we say it's land tenure. It means just to have the land and use it. And um, you can have uh, your activities and so on. But it's not simply the land. It's people who want a state for themselves. They want a state, political power, the control of the power and the state. It's not a land simply. Land, I can have the land and live on the land I, I bought from the state and I work, no problem. But there in the Eastern DRC, you have ethno-nationalism as one of the, the root cause of the conflict. And people keep talking about uh, natural resources only or land tenure only. No, you need to have it completely. If you don't have it completely, your uh, solutions will be uh, simply something somewhere, but without addressing that root cause. And finally, complicities. These complicities between local people and those who are leading atrocities some local people, so I, I mean local leaders, 
and national leaders, Kinshasa is complicit in things there. When I say Kinshasa, I mean people in the government, people in, in, the, in the parliament, people in, um, in the military. And those situations make things difficult to get uh, 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 the, the work of all of the organization involved to be uh, resolved. And then you have themselves, if I can look at many organizations coming from the US or uh, Sweden or uh, any country of the um, Europe, you ha they, ha they have their own interests and complicity with those who are leading atrocities, be they from the uh, armed groups or uh, so that's comments I had and I and I think we need to address those things clearly before we can expect to have the solution to the problem. I I hope I didn't hurt anyone and I, I apologize if I, I hurt anyone. Thank you very much. No, thank you for so much for sharing. And if uh, any of our hosts would like to respond. Yes, um, thank you so much. I think I, I probably should have prefaced this whole presentation with um, it is a very, very small section of the total research that we're presenting because we're trying to take it from the angle of our, our lessons learned by the research process and less so about the actual findings of the research. So I, I would encourage you to um, read the research report afterwards and, and definitely share your thoughts with us because you touched on a lot of really, really important issues. Um, a lot of which are are covered in the in the research, particularly around um, the the understanding land issues and these structural issues as a part of the process where identity becomes significant, where identity is mobilized um, in contestations over power and resources. So there's a lot more nuance in the report. Um, Dimitri or Adji, do you have anything else to add to that? I mean, uh, like I mentioned uh, in the presentation, that the, the complex interlinkages between land, power, and identity, and the interplay between those uh, are what I'll, most of the interviewees, at least, had uh, cited as one of the, the crux of the issue um, that uh, acts as a sort of root cause of violence. And that's where I want to emphasize that, not to discount that identity doesn't play any role. It does. It's just that identity, seeing it uh, externally uh, only via a lens that uh, looks at ethnic conflict and identity-based violence is potentially reductive and harmful. And then it can't be separated from the, uh, the, the linkages that it has with, with power and with land. So that's, that's basically what I was trying to say. Great, uh, thank you. We have um, a couple questions. And um, first I'm going to uh, at, uh, ask for a clarification. This is from uh, Chriselle Kamanzi asking, um, by local, by you, when you say local researchers, researchers, excuse me, here, uh, do you mean in the country or within the region? Uh, this is in the country. So the, the research okay. institute is based in Bukavu in South Kivu. And um, also to respond to another element of the previous question, most of the interviews that they conducted were not necessarily conducted in French. They could have been done in Kiswahili or, or other um, uh, languages, if needed, like Kurundi or so on near the Burundian border. But um, the afterwards, though, the whatever the content that that came out of those interviews were then translated into French, so that it would be understandable by by us and others. So great. We did try to acknowledge the the fact that some people are not comfortable in French. Um. Also, just a clarification: it, the researchers uh, that RSU works with, they have a network of I think 800 researchers across the entirety of DRC. So um, depending on the three contexts that research was conducted and they had local researchers for those regions specifically as well. So there's a, a combination of RSC's core staff as well as research assistants who are local to the areas. Great, thank you. And I recognize we're past the 45 minute um, mark, but I have a couple of questions here. A lot of them are around um, framing of of terms and ideas and and so I'm just going to get to them quickly. If, if people have to leave, I understand. Um, but uh, we have a few questions here from uh, Ruth uh, Rhodes Allen, who's here uh, talking from CDA Collaborative. Um, 
first saying thank you for the presentation um, and recognizing that your methodology methodology shifts are very resonant with CDA's collaborative learning approach. So very um, full of appreciation for the exploratory process. Um, did you find it confusing for people within communities or only with global actors? Um, if a different if a difference, what do you make of the difference for communicating the research with the multiple target audiences? Thank you, Ruth, for the very tough question, <laughs> 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 um, which I feel like could, could take me a week to be able to answer appropriately. Um, Aji and Dimitri, please jump in on this because I'm just going from my kind of gut memory here. Um, I think we had more difficulties discussing the concepts actually at the international policy level than at the local level. Um, people that we were interviewing seemed to have a pretty firm grasp on what they viewed as identity-based violence or atrocities and what they wanted us to take away from that discussion. Um, whereas at the level of policy and with kind of um, international partners we have, the conversations got a lot muddier because we were we're grappling with the kind of distinctions between jargon and terminology that is useful in the policy realm versus what is useful in the realm of, of peace building or atrocity prevention practice um so practical kind of application of those terms and i think we're still doing a lot of thinking on this in terms of um our own understanding of it and and how we understand where we want to place emphasis on certain terms being useful and being employed um but really there's yeah i think there's a lot more thinking we need to do on that to um to have a kind of stance i've forgotten the second question within that jennifer if you could <laughs> repeat oh oh goodness i think i removed it from my list i'm sorry it, it was more to do about how if you have um multiple groups that you're identifying and targeting um that you want to work with how do you how do you deal with the differences in perhaps what you just discussed that they may have. And um, I'm sorry, Ruth, I probably completely <laughs> messed up your question. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm totally clear on that. Um, do you mean in terms of the like groups locally in terms of interviewees or the various stakeholders for the project overall? Oh, Ruth, if you're still with us, if you don't mind uh, clarifying, just sending it in really fast in the chat to me. I Oh, I can unmute you. I, I'll unmute Ruth. Um, I, I can unmute you. No problem. Um, let me find you. And sorry that I I was getting I was getting too excited and and uh, so here you oh oh it says you're self muted Ruth so maybe click on it again and I will also unmute you. Oh you're unmuted. Perfect. Thank you Ruth. Ruth? It says you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Um, I I will leave you unmute if you want to. Um, okay, she says you basically uh, answered her question. Also, okay. there was a there was a second question, and, and Ruth, I'll leave you unmute um, on my end, and, and maybe it'll come through at some point if you want to jump in. Um, but there was a second question from Ruth about um, the uh, the thematics of land governance which issues and identity-based violence, which you did touch on. But um, did communities make a distinction between these issues or understand them as one and the same? Again, this kind of touched on Ruth's earlier uh, question uh, around framing research findings and for whom are you framing these research findings? Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, so interviewees had, and this is kind of tied to what I was trying to convey before, that, that they had a very clear understanding of the way these dynamics work together. So when we'd ask questions around their perception of identity-based violence, what kind of key issues were, we often had people who would stop us and say, we shouldn't be framing this as identity-based violence. Yes, identity is involved, but that's not the cause. The cause is the fact that you have competing um, land institutions, you have competing frameworks for those institutions, um, you have different levels of access to resources for different communities or different types of people, um, and they made a very strong point for us to 
not only understand this in the research, but reflect it in how we communicated the research that um, identity, the, the framing of the conflict as identity or conflicts as identity based is a kind of narrow external understanding um, that makes it seem as if it's, you know, different actors pitted against each other because of their identity groups. Um, whereas actually identity is not um, homogenous in every case, including with militias. You can have militias that are aligned around an identity group one week and the next week they change and they're completely um, diverse in that. So um, they, yeah, they really wanted to make the point that um, identity is very much a tool and it's something that allows these issues to, um, to lead to mobilization for certain outcomes, whether it's, uh, it's resource power, economic power, political power, et cetera. Um, oh, I, and, sorry, Adji, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to add to that really quickly. Um, and the, one of the reasons why these nuances might not be as perceptible in the international stage, it can be due to funding. For example, I remember one of the interviewees saying that they do understand that um, their work, like the definition for atrocity prevention might be different from the international level. However, when it comes to call for funding or proposals, they can't really correct the funder as in their definition of atrocity. So sometimes they might go along with it just in order to have funds so that they can carry out their work. So this is one of the ways that um, understanding might be lost in the process. Great, thank you. And uh, we have two more questions that I'm going to kind of just throw together. They're not really connected, so please, I, I, I mean, I apologize. Um, so uh, just so we can in soon, unfortunately, but um, my colleague Ryan Ayachi from uh, Searches, actually Searches uh, MENA Atrocity Prevention Project, um, did have a bit more questions around um, local actors framing atrocity prevention different from external frameworks, which I feel like you've covered really well in the past few questions since uh, YM sent this question in. So um, initially the question was about um, expanding a bit more on how you dealt with this challenge, which I feel like you, you, you answered well, but if you have some, something else you want to add, please feel free to. But um, there was the additional question of how would um, international practitioners deal with the differing understanding and framing, and if you maybe could give a quick um, specific example, I'm assuming this is for, you know, a, a good example that maybe YM could bring back to their own atrocity prevention program at SEARCH. Um, and that's number one, and I'm sorry, this is quite different, um, but if you could just, and I know the answer will probably be read the report, which I have linked um, in the chat box, and it probably is the best answer, but if you do have just a moment to touch on briefly, um, Carol St. Laurent from Cry Peace did ask if you identified any successful interventions um, to prevent land, uh, atrocities or stabilize land tenures, and maybe just like throw out a couple of those. Um, and then I will say, as I'm sure you will too, read the report, everyone. Thank you. So I know two very different questions, but we have just a couple more minutes um, if, if you'd like to touch on either of those. Yep, I can take a stab and Dimitri and Algie, always feel free to jump in. Um, for the first question, if I can remember it right, um, and I, I, I think, can help you again if, if you need yeah. reminder. Yeah. yeah, I need visuals for these things. Um, yeah, I think one of the big lessons for us was, um, and, and in terms of how we're approaching kind of the advocacy for dissemination of this work, um, is around trying to get different actors within the atrocity prevention system to understand where terminology is useful in, in certain contexts and where it becomes problematic. And a very tangible understanding of the problematic use of it, I would say, is through funding modalities that specify um, a specific atrocity prevention activity without understanding that in a context, atrocity prevention is much more integrated with other prevention frameworks. And so you're forcing a kind of false um, dichotomy or, or the silo um, that actually reduces the ability for local actors to collaborate and, and coordinate their efforts in a really effective way. So you see a lot of duplication of um, EWR systems in the same kind of geographic space, um, a lot of actors doing very similar work, but not really being allowed to work together um, in any in any clear way. Um, uh, second, Adji, Dimitri, do you have anything to add to that one? 
No, I think you, you answered. Okay, and second one, did we identify successful interventions? Yes. The, so the research has a section on um, factors of success for atrocity prevention work. It's a lot more broad than specific activities, um, but there is um, a, a really strong theme throughout the research, and I think for anyone who works in peace building and, and these kinds of issues, this is not an unfamiliar type of activity, but the use of community dialogues that bring together all the stakeholders in, in the conflict um, was just repeated as useful for so many different different aspects of the work. So um, in addressing a lot of the weaknesses of current atrocity prevention, including coordination, collaboration issues, um, actors talked about being able to have these dialogue events and set up ongoing sustainable dialogues to bring conflicting parties together, including security actors, state actors, um, community members, civil society, academics, et cetera, bring anyone who's relevant to a particular issue um, to have conversations about that, to conduct conflict analysis, to identify complementarities between their activities. Um, and we had some very good examples from the Tanzanian atrocity prevention um, system, where those local dialogues essentially became the, the foundation for the national atrocity prevention mechanism being really highly functional. Um, so being able to build kind of horizontal relationships is a really, really um, clear outcome from these dialogue activities. They're very low funding, um, so kind of high uh, cost uh, value there. Um, and then they're able to, to start building horizontal connections as well. So issues of trust, you can rebuild trust through these dialogues and reestablish kind of connections between civil society or, or civilians in the state. Great. Thank you so much. And just being very aware of the time. And I know our wonderful hosts and also everyone in the audience, I'm sure, needs to rush off and either in their work days or get on to um, some more really important work. Um, I want to wrap things up for us. And as always, if I had to rush through your questions or I didn't pose it exactly how you would have, I encourage you to please, um, once I post the recording on our website, to feel free to comment um, under the recording. And I will make sure that those comments get to our host today and um, maybe we can get more of a response for you. And also feel free to email DME for Peace um, at, DME, at DME for Peace at dmeforpeace.com. Uh, Sorry, it's DME. I'll write it in the chat box. But um, feel free to email us as well. Um, and I will put the email address in one second, but let me wrap up. Um, so again, thank you to our hosts, Megan, Ajid, and Dimitri, and everyone who could join us today and everyone listening in. Um, again, let me drop the full report. For everyone um, in the chat box if you haven't seen it and this will go up of course with the recording and additionally the link to RISD uh, Peace Direct's partner in all of this um, so I drop both of them just for last minute if everyone wants to save them on their computer tabs um, and a reminder this recording um, the recording and helpful links I have shared with you today will be posted with the webinar recording on DME for Peace site um, by the end of this week under the m and &E Thursday Talk section so that you are able to return to it and share it with your colleagues. And as I said, please feel free to continue the discussion or ask your questions online in the comments section. Um, thank you so much. Um, that's it for us today. We'll be back next June, or sorry, We'll be back next in June um, with the Institute for Economics and Peace. Uh, we will be taking a deep dive into current trends in global peace and the Global Peace Index, which is being launched next month. Uh, the registration page for this will go up on the website within the next week, and we will send out the link as always through our emails and social media. Um, Sorry. Oh, sorry. It was a thank you. I saw a message come up. It was a thank you. So thank you, host. Um, that's it for me. And thank you so much. We have multiple thank yous coming in from the audience for our hosts today. So thank you so much uh, for bringing us this wonderful presentation and your insightful answers to the questions and to the audience for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of your days wherever you are.
And I also added our email address at the bottom if you want to contact us. Thank you so much, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.